Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, oil and the trillion dollar IPO we thought would never happen. Parts of Saudi Arabia's state owned oil company Aramco may be going public, but will auctioning off a slice give the House of Saud more time to weather the oil price storm? Also this week, a company called Wanda will tell you about the group which just bought a major stake in the Hollywood studio behind Batman and Godzilla. It's owned by China's richest person and is fast becoming a media powerhouse. Plus, a flash crash in the South African rand. Why the jittery currency is posing huge questions about the government's economic strategy and putting financial pressure on everyday South Africans. You know, when the price of oil drops below $30 a barrel, as it did this past week, you know things are getting really serious. But that one number is just the tip of the problem, because the other thing we've seen this past week are some of the world's major oil-producing countries and companies having to tear up their budgets and start all over. Projects are being stalled, capital expenditure slashed, and financial planners are having to really change tack and readjust their budgets and their projections. For example, Russia cutting its budget expenditure by 10% in response to the plunge in oil prices. BP cutting 600 jobs in the North Sea, which is one of the world's most expensive places to pump oil, and reducing its headcount by 4,000 workers in exploration and production. Petrobras, that is Brazil's oil giant, downsizing its investment plans for the third time in six months. And Nigeria, Africa's biggest oil producer, it wants an OPEC emergency meeting at the same time as it issues yet more debt to balance the budget. And then there's Saudi Arabia, which came out with something no one really saw coming. It announced it was considering listing the state oil giant Aramco on the Saudi stock exchange. Now, with oil prices so low, it does make financial sense. You get some money out of your assets. But selling off the family silver, that's not something the Saudis would do lightly. Aramco is the giant of global oil, the world's largest company in the oil business, it's also the backbone of the Saudi economy. But the oil business just isn't creating enough cash these days. I think what they need is more revenue of some sort. So obviously if they sell bits of Aramco, they'll get some in. And of course you can still improve efficiency of, of uh, whatever a state-owned company does. Even with the low oil price, the numbers associated with Aramco highlight why this could be such a significant initial public offer. It has reserves of about 260 billion barrels of oil, which represents over 15% of the world's proven oil reserves. On a daily basis, Aramco is producing 9.5 million barrels of black gold. Aramco officials say they'll offer shares in the refining joint ventures with foreign oil companies, but it's not clear if a slice of its more coveted exploration and production operations will be included. It's Saudi Arabia's $98 billion budget deficit, which is seen by many analysts as the main reason for the listing. But Saudi officials insist it's simply part of an attempt to diversify the economy beyond oil and have the private sector play a bigger role. I think Saudi Arabia has been going through a process of at least attempting to have economic reforms, cutting back on uh, areas of non-essential spending, but also seeing how it can diversify as much as it possibly can. And it's also charging a bit more for various things. Although the Saudi market opened to direct foreign investment last year, participation in this IPO might well be limited to local investors as a way of sharing the kingdom's oil wealth. The fact Aramco is even considering it, though, is a sign that low oil prices are truly biting for the world's biggest oil player. Saudi Arabia, I think, built its, uh, its next year budget at around $40 per barrel. If oil goes to 30, that pr translates to about uh, $25 million billion extra deficit. But Saudi Arabia has about $600 billion of reserves. So that deficit is less than 10%. So Saudi Arabia is in a very good position to weather out this. It's countries like Iran, it's countries like, not the Middle East, countries like Russia, you know, which are heading into a uh, recession that may have a huge problem uh, financing this difference. Now, there's talk of even lower prices. Where and who is it all coming from? The where, well, oil bounced off 12-year lows twice this past week because of oversupply and a wave of pessimism, really, about exactly how low it can go. 
that is fueled by the WHO, and this is the likes of Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs analysts who say, quote, oil in the 20s is possible. But it's Standard Chartered which produced the lowest forecast. It's talking about an oil price of just $10 a barrel before the market reaches a bottom. Just to put that in perspective, a year ago it was around $56. A year and a half ago it was above 110 well, let's go to Riyadh now to speak to former IMF economist Fahad Al-Turki. He is now chief economist and head of research at Jadwa Investment Bank. You know, we've watched the price of oil go below $30. There are predictions of $20 or even $10. How in the short term can the Saudi economy deal with that? It's just an incredibly low number for a country so reliant on oil. So it's very hard to predict oil prices. We, we, we look at a number of institutions that predict oil prices and we follow their projections. It varies greatly from month to month and from even week to week. Now, to answer your question on the implication on the Saudi economy and a policymaker uh, respond to that, I think for the short term there isn't, there isn't a greater worry there because of the huge financial debt that the government has. Uh, and I think that depth in financially uh, gives a little bit of comfort in the short term. The issue remains in the long term. What if oil prices remain low uh, for, say, three to five years' time? Mm. Uh, and we've seen the number of initiatives that was announced in the last few weeks. Uh, one of them is the reform to, to domestic energy prices. Uh, these, are, these reforms are likely uh, to uh, improve uh, the government financial position uh, and also uh, improve managing the economy into more of a mature economy. So what's your view then of the actual Aramco listing? Is it, as the Saudi government says, you know, part of the overall financial scheme or is it more of a desperate move in these times of, of very, very low oil prices? We can take away from the recent announcement of having Aramco IPO uh, is that uh, all cards uh, in the table uh, for Saudi Arabia reform uh, and the movement forward. We think that 2016 is likely to be a year where the economy is transformed into more of a, a, a mature economy or the policy at least that will be put in place will transform the economy into more of a mature economy within the next uh, three to five years. How much market interest, though, do you believe there would be in any Aramco listing, even though the Saudi Stock Exchange has been open up to foreign investors? I suspect this would be more of a um, domestic listing, and I'm wondering how much internal interest there would be in buying up these shares. Uh, I think there is a greater interest. If, we, if we're talking about Aramco, I, I mean, look, there is, there is a capacity limit to what can be listed in the local market. Uh, and I think a gradual listing of some of the subsidiaries and some of the downstream industries is acceptable within the next uh, uh, two, to three, two to three years. Uh, so a gradual approach is likely to be uh, the situation moving forward in terms of listing the subsidiaries and downstream industries. Um, I think there is a great appetite uh, for, uh, for such listing within the local market. Problem I see though, Dr. Fahad, not to state the obvious, is that it's all still about oil. Now we have been talking to guests on this show about this for years, the fact that oil economies need to um, diversify and they all say yes, yes we will, but it doesn't really seem to happen. But then something like this happens, a major fall in the oil price, and they're not really still ready to deal with it. Well, I think there, there is a strategic uh, approach that has been starting a long time ago in terms of opening the economy before even uh, uh, privatizing uh, some part of the uh, oil industry. Uh, open up of uh, the telecommunication industry in Saudi Arabia happened about more than 10 years ago. Uh, opening up the financial sector in Saudi Arabia, be it in the banking sector or in the, in the uh, insurance industry mm. happened in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and I think more policies is likely to be uh, announced in the coming weeks with the national transformation program that will be uh, opening up some of the industries uh, as well as uh, getting uh, some of the uh, reform that 
was delayed previously to be uh, up to speed uh, mm. into the next uh, few years, in particular privatization and other, uh, and other initiatives. I think also related to that diversification strategy, I think we will hear uh, down in, uh, in the mid, around mid-2016, we will hear uh, a new uh, industrial strategy that will be uh, particularly important for the diversification initiatives that we will see within the next few years. Fahad Al-Turki on the Saudi oil situation there. Dr. Fahad, thank you for your time. Now, there is one flip side to this low oil price business, and that's low petrol prices. The British auto body, the RAC, for example, is talking about prices of $1.20 a litre, cheaper than bottled water, which would, of course, be fantastic for consumers. But even with that and an uptick in demand for gas-guzzling trucks and SUVs in the U.S., the automakers still know that alternative fuel cars are the future. John Hendren has more on that high-tech future from the Detroit Motor Show. These are the cars you won't be seeing on the road anytime soon. The door handle that comes out automatically. But they will influence the new cars rolling off assembly lines in the next few years. And you can see the way that captures the light through mm -hmm. there. The concept cars introduced this week at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit are designed to draw attention to the automaker and experiment with new ideas that might or might not make their way into the cars and dealers' lots. Shows the vision for Acura going forward exterior and interior. The sleek, muscular Acura Precision won the conference's Design Excellence Award for concept cars. For the rear, we wanted to create somewhat more of a luxury feeling. And the front, we wanted to have it be focused on performance. Because this car, especially from the interior standpoint, it represents our new direction of precision crafted performance. With its suicide doors and curved display screen, it looks like no Acura on the road. And that's the main screen where you can see the vehicle data. Audi pointed to the future with its H-Tron Quattro concept car, run on hydrogen, an engineering challenge still to be worked out. The H-Tron Quattro is our next step, our next evolution in electric uh, driving, mobility. It has low profile door handles, rear view cameras, no mirrors. We see the rear camera here. A self-opening fuel panel and two big advantages over electric cars. A 600 mile range and a refueling time of as little as four minutes. Electric cars can take hours to refuel. The Buick Avista is leaner and sportier than any Buick on the road with a hefty 400 horsepower and door and seat panels made with a 3D printer. The latest Lincoln Continental began as a concept car and was introduced Tuesday as a production model for 2017, aimed at the North American and Chinese markets. It has new sleeker lines, doors that spring open at the touch, and a design that says wealth without drawing sports car attention. One of the things that our customers want is to make things easier and more intuitive. So experience that handle, press that, and how the effort this is a car that's designed as much for the passenger in back as the one in front. This seat heats, cools, reclines, and massages, and you can control the audio and the climate right here. Some of the cars rolled out this week will never make it to production, but you're likely to see elements from them as soon as next year. And still ahead on counting the costs, David Bowie, the man who sold the world and also created financial oddities that proved ahead of their time. It's a lesser known side to the music and cultural icon who passed away aged 69. For now though, we look at South Africa where the currency, the Rand, touched levels this week not seen since 2008. Unfortunately, they're low levels, 9% lower against the US dollar at one stage. And that flash crash means investors are worried about the local economy. Slowing demand from China is one factor, but also a decision by President Zuma to change his finance minister twice in a week late last year means there is a lack of faith in the government. Haru Mutasa has our report from Johannesburg. What's happened to these shoes? Zandele Sambo needs to buy a new pair of school shoes for her daughter, but she can barely afford them after paying school fees for her three children. She earns $150 a month. $35 goes to school fees, $50 to school uniforms and books. What about this bag? What's left over goes to food and transport. She says prices have doubled in South Africa since last year. Here in South Africa, you know, we're suffering now. We're really suffering. I don't know what this comes from, really. On Monday, the rand fell to its lowest levels against the dollar in more than seven years. Households are being told they will have to limit spending as the prices of basic foods and household products, especially imported items, increase. 
The South African currency, the RAND, lost 25% of its value against the US dollar last year. This huge slide was partly because of a slump in commodity prices and slowing growth. Economists warn things will get harder, especially for the poor. Some economists also blame President Jacob Zuma's decision to fire the finance minister last year, which made the markets nervous. They point out that the currency slide, as well as increasing the cost of basic imports, reflects faltering confidence in how well the economy is being managed. It is the rest of the world sending South Africa a serious message. Get your house in order economically. You can't have a situation where the rest of the world is losing confidence in South Africa. The underperforming economy could also see the ruling African National Congress lose some support to opposition parties, especially in the urban areas, during the local government elections in a few months. The ANC actually seems to be blaming the private sector uh, for manipulating the currency, for manipulating the economy to undermine uh, President Jacob Zuma's administration. That lack of trust between the governing party and the, 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 the private sector makes it very difficult for one to imagine any workable solution to alleviate this immediate problem. Government ministers are under pressure to find solutions fast to this economic crisis. Whatever long-term changes need to be made, it's the short term that interests people, feeling the downturn in already tight household budgets. Still with foreign currencies, and China's yuan saw its second steepest fall since 2005, just last month. But that has actually helped the world's biggest exporter post stronger monthly trade figures. China's exports measured in US dollars fell 1.4% in December. It doesn't sound great, but that's compared with a 6.8% fall in November. Imports, they were down 7.6% compared with November's 8.7% drop, so more evidence there of sluggish demand for commodities. And overall, China's trade surplus widened to $60.1 billion. We must say, though, there is some concern over whether China's economic trade data can really be trusted. We'll have to see what the markets and currencies make of its 2015 GDP data, which is out soon as well. Joining us from London to talk about such data is Sanjeev Shah, Chief Investment Officer at Sun Global Investment. Sanjeev, sweating on economic data from China seems to be a new sport for economists now, I think perhaps even more than uh, they did US data. But I wonder, as we said, about the transparency of it. GDP, trade data numbers, do you trust what you see? Hi, uh, happy to be here, Kamal. Um, in fact, I think all government numbers are, should be treated with some suspicion. Uh, in the case of China, people are a little bit suspicious about the growth figures. As you know, the government is forecasting growth data of about seven, a growth target of about seven and a half percent. But independent analysts who look at things which uh, the government can't manipulate, uh, things like uh, electricity demand and so on, mm -hmm. are noting that that is growing at uh, a level which is much less and is re not really consistent with growth of that level. Uh, most people think that the underlying growth in China is perhaps closer to five percent. Uh, rather than the seven and a half the government is, uh, the government is uh, projecting or, or uh, targeting. Uh, this week, of course, we saw the export data. And mm. again, um, there may be some uh, problems which are not necessarily uh, caused by the government, but just the nature of, the, of trade data, uh, which means they may not be correctly stated. And so we've got uh, GDP numbers coming out soon for the full year, which is significant. But by definition, GDP numbers are backwards looking, aren't they? So again, what do you look for when you see such growth numbers? What do you actually get out of them? Uh, as I said, all numbers uh, of this nature should be treated with uh, a pinch of salt. But clearly, the, the, the big picture is that China is not growing at the kind of numbers that it grew in the last two decades. It's slowing down, and most informed independent analysts think it's slowing down quite quickly. Mm. And we're seeing impact of this in the uh, stock market and in the currency markets, and the government uh, and the authorities in China are responding to this and really uh, finding some difficulty with controlling markets. Uh, I think the growth data will uh, show a strong number, but as I said, most people will discount that by 2 or 3% in order to make an estimate of the actual true underlying growth. Okay. The other problem we've got here, Sanjeev, is the actual Chinese markets. They are obviously very, very volatile these days, and we've seen them react badly to previous data. Now, yes, the, uh, the automatic, what do they call it, the circuit breaker, if you like, has been taken out of the picture, but I wonder, are we still going to see such volatility for, you know, f well, who knows how long yet? I think, I think uh, we are in for a volatile period. Uh, perhaps uh, that's the nature of markets. You have long periods of volatility followed by periods of stability. 
but clearly at the moment the markets are in a, in a, in a volatile phase. Uh, obviously what's driving this is that there was a huge stock market boom last year which uh, peaked in July and from July to August the market fell about 40 percent and a lot of small investors had got in perhaps on leverage terms at the top of the market. I think the numbers indicated there, about, there were 90 million individual investors uh, which is more than members of the Communist Party uh, mm. in China and a lot of those people are now losing money and losing a lot of money. So I think there's a lot of anger and uh, frustration there and uh, I think the, the longer term um, uh, trend doesn't look very good. Obviously, in the context of a slowing economy, where even at the best of times, Chinese companies weren't making that much profit, um, clearly uh, the stock market is, is, is headed for a, for a decline. Mm. So all told, we've got a problem here, haven't we, Sanjeev? Because China affects everything, every part of the world. And here we are only a few weeks into 2016, and therefore it's not really looking great for the, the global economy, is it? China is the second largest economy in the world now, so it obviously has a key importance. From 2010 to 2012, emerging markets, and mainly China, contributed to about 75% of global growth. So when the West was in a crisis uh, and slowing growth after the global financial crisis, it was China and emerging markets which carried uh, the growth. Mm. And now clearly China is slowing down, mm. and we saw the World Bank uh, last week uh, downgrading their forecasts for global growth, mainly on the back of China. And a lot of people are arguing, well, the stock market doesn't matter so much uh, in a global sense because it's mainly local investors who are losing money and are participating. Of much more importance is the currency market where we've seen um, a trend towards weakness and obviously the underlying data, in particular the data of capital flight, uh, i.e. the amount of capital leaving China, has, it, has risen very sharply uh, in October and November. So a lot of people, perhaps anticipating that the currency is on a weakening trend, are, are selling the local currency and buying foreign currency. Equally, uh, exporters who have dollars are in no rush to convert that into yuan. If they think the yuan is going to fall, mm -hmm. they might as well hold the dollars for a while and, and convert at a more favorable rate in the future. A big picture look at China there with Sanjeev Shah in London. Sanjeev, thank you so much for your time. Now to a couple of names you've probably not heard of, Wang Jianlin and his company Wanda. Wang is a Chinese real estate and entertainment tycoon who's bought up the US film studio Legendary Entertainment for three and a half billion dollars. Now this is the studio behind the Batman movies, so it's no slouch in the movie business. Rob Reynolds has this report. Legendary Entertainment has produced several films that were major hits in China, like Godzilla and Pacific Rim. China is fast overtaking the U.S. as the biggest movie marketplace on earth, and Wanda's acquisition is the biggest move yet by a Chinese company into the U.S. entertainment industry. I think it's a very good acquisition for both Legendary and uh, Wang Jianlin and, and Wanda because they're very complementary, um, and it fills needs for both. This is one plank in a larger strategy to be a world-class company. Wanda is building what it says will be the world's largest film and TV studio complex in China and recently bought major movie theater chains in the U.S. and Australia. Company chairman Wang Jianlin, China's richest person, has close ties to the government in Beijing, but critics say it's unlikely that Legendary's roster of monster and giant robot flicks will be used to advance a political agenda. The head of Legendary, uh, Thomas Tull, has been quite, uh, he's been quite forward in, in his saying, he's already talked to filmmakers, he said it's not going to affect the product, it's not going to affect the way we do business, it's not going to affect our existing deals. Films in Legendary's pipeline include another remake of King Kong. Wanda's big move reflects not only the company's global ambitions, but China's desire to exercise soft power through entertainment and culture. Wang has said his goal is to take a dominant role in global media, controlling 20% of the global film market by 2020. And finally this week, David Bowie, music legend, cultural chameleon, a true one-off, who sadly passed away at the age of 69 after a battle with cancer. He will be long remembered for pushing musical and fashion boundaries. But amongst the tributes, it's worth pointing out Bowie was also a financial innovator. Back in 1997, the star launched Bowie Bonds. They worked by selling investors an income stream based on royalties from his back catalogue of music. At the time, Bowie Bonds represented a brand new way of investing, and the artist himself pocketed $55 million from the venture. 
Also, well before YouTube and Facebook, Bowie set up his own internet service provider, BowieNet, in 1998. Customers got access to what was then one of the fastest internet connections, again, ahead of his time. And in 2000, it was online banking that attracted his attention. Bowie Bank offered David Bowie branded credit cards. Admittedly, not all of these ventures panned out as he may have wished, but as an artist, there was no downplaying his successes. 26 studio albums over almost five decades, 140 million records sold, and a net worth of around $230 million at the time of his death. However, it was Bowie's contribution to music and popular culture that was probably his greatest asset, a contribution no one can truly put a price on. And that is our show for this week. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That takes you straight to our page with individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. You can also get in touch with us. You can tweet me at KamalAJE. And do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.